pivotal moment in both of your lives where dreams of all things came into the story. Shabazz, could you tell us about this dream that you had and then Shaheen, uh, what happened to you after that? The Lord gave me a lot of dreams. It's one of the most significant dreams that I had was when I was seeking to find out what He wants me to do, what is His will for me. And because um, I didn't know. I, I had become a Christian. Um, I was, I didn't know the direction I should go. And the young man that led me to Christ, he, I didn't see him. After a couple of weeks, I didn't see him again because I moved somewhere else. So I was seeking God for that direction. And one night, uh, He gave me a dream. And in my dream, He showed me something very significant. He, he actually showed me the seventh day Sabbath in my dream. He, he showed it to me. And He showed me that it was, it was brighter than on the other days of the week, that it was not a secular day, that it was a spiritual day. And, that, and then He showed me that He had established that way back in the Garden of Eden, and that, that before even sin had come. And that was, a, that was a, a memorial of His creation. And, and then He showed me all that, and, and, uh, and He told me that He wants me to keep the Sabbath. So, as you're opening up your heart to Christ, as you're making these decisions to follow Him, light begins to come into your life. Bible truths begin to come into your experience. Absolutely. Shaheen, yeah. what happened to you? Well, we started to persecute Him, not physically, mentally and verbally. Um, the worst that I did was, um, I grabbed him by his collar and <laughs> lifted him up and threw him against the wall. That's the worst that I did, that I apologize. I've asked him to forgive me. I'll ask him for Does he again. still apologize <laughs> to you to this day? <laughs> He's done it a few times. <laughs> a few times. Uh, I told him he doesn't when you to. When you <laughs> realize that you were wrong hmm. and that you were actually fighting the true God of the universe, is heavy when you find that out. Even that night when I did that to him, I sensed the conviction. But I had this dream that was very specific. Uh, one time he uh, woke me up to go to church with him, and I had just gone to party the night before. Uh, mind you, I was not, uh, I was not into drinking and drugs. I, that was not the thing I liked. I just liked to party. I just liked to go out and have fun with my friends. And I, had, uh, I just didn't want to go to church. I was tired, and I was not even a you know, confirmed Christian yet. And I, I, when I told him no, I immediately fell back to sleep, and I had this very specific dream. I saw myself in a room, and I saw Jesus in my dream. And Jesus was standing on the other end of the room, and he, in his own special way, he revealed to me that it was I who invited you to church through your brother. Mm. And when you said no to him, you said no to me. And that dream was very significant. I. It, it didn't make me a Christian right away because, as I said, it took me eight years of struggling until I finally was brought to that point of surrender. That was one of the dreams that I had. Wow. So with all the things that are taking place, how did your lives begin to change as a result? Start with you, Shabbat. Yeah, immensely. I mean, um, for me, everything changed. I, I was completely a different person in my I, I know that at the time when my family rejected my experience, Jesus gave al almost every one of them dreams. And one by one, they all accepted Christ. Because Jesus, even my sister had a dream where Jesus told her, uh, specifically naming me, said, if you don't follow me like Shabazz, fo your brother follows me, you're not going to be with me in paradise. And uh, one by one, my older brother, Shaheen, my sister, everybody, eventually everyone, including my parents, all became believers. Now, I noticed this is actually fairly common in the Middle East. Uh, people have dreams. They end up becoming Bible-believing Christians. Why do you think this happens a lot? One of the reasons why this is so significant over there is that dreams are looked upon as as a spiritual means of communication. They believe that heaven speaks to you through dreams. So dreams are not dealt with in a slight, with a slight. They're actually taken very seriously. And God understands that, and, and uh, obviously. And the people know that they can depend on that. One more uh, a significant event that's taking place right now as we speak in, in Iran, the country that I come from, is that Iranians are responding to the gospel at, at, in numbers unimaginable. Iranian, Iran is converting to Christianity at a rate of almost 20% annually. 
I mean, that, that same, uh, the same cannot be spoken for the United States. The growth for Christianity in the United States is right now 0.04%. So Iranians are responding to the gospel, to the message of Jesus in ways unimaginable. In fact, one, uh, one uh, expert said Iran is the first Islamic nation that we can actually say is post-Islamic. 60% of Iranians d do not claim Islam as a religion anymore. The other 40%, only 2% are practicing Muslims. 38% do not practice Islam. It's, it, there is a religious awakening that's happening in Iran, and, and, and this, their ambiguity is absolutely the opportunity for God to be able to do something ma major in Iran, and it's happening. You know, it's, it's really fascinating. When you're studying out the scripture, you find out that God's MO, His modus operandi, is to use people. Yes as his ministers, as his witnesses. But when you're dealing with countries like Iran or other Middle Eastern countries where proselytizing is illegal and punishable by death, it seems that God will utilize other avenues to be able to communicate the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, you read about this, God will use things like animals and weather and dreams right. when the human messenger fails. Shaheen. Can I say this, that another reason I see why that dream becomes so important is that these people are in great darkness and they need a great light something to uh, jolt their life and make him realize their need and uh, so God uses the very thing that they put so much emphasis on to bring such great light to them as he did for us right well we're going to talk about the similarities and differences between Islam and Christianity are there similarities between Islam and Christianity what are those? In Islam, I remember as a kid, we used to go to um, one of our, um, we call it in Farsi, we, at least we say ziyarat of a, uh, a, a imam in Iran, which a is pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. Yeah, in English we call it pilgrimage. Uh, the uh, eighth imam of the Shia belief. And so we, we put emphasis on that. That pilgrimage brings you closer to Allah. That pilgrimage makes you more more uh, aware that you know Allah will accept you and doing our uh, prayers uh, that we would do uh, all day long. In Christianity it is not so. In Christianity I don't need to go to a building to find God. In Christianity I can be in my bedroom. I can be at work sitting behind my desk. I could be driving. I can have an experience with God which is lasting and important and it's real and it's, it's, it, you can actually sense the presence of God which in Islam we didn't. That's how I can answer it, the difference that I saw. Your connection to God is not limited to a geographical That's location. Right. That's right. right. If you wanted to look for, the, for common ground, common points or similarities, I would say like the similarity is that the belief that they, they worship the same God. Uh, Muslims believe that they worship the same God that Christians worship. Um, there, is, there is this sense of, um, uh, for instance, they have certain uh, uh, religious practices that they do, but well, Christians also have practices. They pray, Christians pray. Um, there are those general things, but, uh, but I would say that in number, what we have in common is much fewer and our differences are much bigger. What would you say is the significant difference when it comes to this idea of atonement? Absolutely, there is no a solution for sin in Islam. Okay. There is no atonement at all. Right. The Muslims live with the reality in their reality. This is their reality, that 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 they may not have eternal life. That's right. Okay. Yeah. It, it seems with this idea, at least from the Christian perspective, that when you're dealing with the sin and guilt, uh, there, there's a justice that's directed towards the breaking of, of God's law, the dynamics of all existence. There needs to be something that happens. It's not something that can just be swept under a rug. There must yeah. be some kind of atonement or sacrifice, right? Yeah. But is this not just appeasement or is this something else? You know, in nature of mankind, our nature is to do things. We, we, are, we are raised from childhood have with a certain perspective of our life that we have to work hard and do everything this way or that way and depending on where we're living, what country, our culture, but we all have the same goals that we have to accomplish this and this and this to gain what we want. 
and that's the very psyche of humanity. But it, the difference is that that in Islam, it it borrows from that very specific basic principle that you know you have to do something for God to accept you, as we have to do something in life to make it in life. But in Christianity, it's so different. You know, there's a sacrifice. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We didn't have to do anything. We have, to, because we couldn't do anything. We had no idea we even needed God. Right. The Bible says that we were all enemies of God. We lived as an enemies of God, thinking we are serving God, but yet we were actually not doing what God wanted us to do. And in Christianity, we see that it was God who took the first step to in this dark world and brought Jesus and gave him. And you know, I believe in, 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 the, in, in his entirety that Jesus is not only the God of the universe, but in the sense that he became a man, he has become our older brother and he understands our pain and our sufferings. And then he has made a way out and it's through the cross. There's no other way. Yeah, the scriptures refer to Jesus as the elder brother. Elder right? brother. You know, God didn't demand a sacrifice. He became the sacrifice. That's right. That's, right? Right. That's what I'm hearing. But this, this concept that God became the sacrifice is actually a sacrilege idea in Islam. Mm -hmm. they, would, they, would, right. they would actually rip their clothes off with that idea that God would come and sacrifice himself for humanity. And um, so, uh, so in a, in, in a, in a ca in, in a capsulated religion where, where there is no real solution for sin, and then you say that God took the, took it upon Himself to be the solution, that's sacrilege. That's like, that's the that's the height of disrespect blasphemy. to God. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Yeah. And um, but when they come to understand the process, then they'll understand that 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 there is no other way but what God has done. Now you recently were talking to a Muslim brother. There was a, an experience that happened recently. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, I met a young uh, Muslim Afghan and uh, I volunteered to take him to the dentist. So in the car we talked and the next visit when I was taking him back, uh, it was a feast of sacrifice, which m all Muslims around the world, just three months ago was feast of sacrifice. Every year it happens. It's a memorial to Abraham offering Ishmael, see, because in Islam, Ishmael was offered, not Isaac. So He's I, considered the promised yeah, son. That's right. right. So I kind of uh, told him, I said, hey, um, happy Feast of Sacrifice, and he gave me warm greetings. He was happy to hear what I said that, knowing that I'm a Christian. And I told him, I said, hey, do you, do you realize the significance of what, feast, what sacrifice is? He goes, of course, a good omen, good luck, happiness. And said, it's all that, but a lot more than that. He goes, what do you mean? So I told him, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. So we went to Garden of Eden, humanity sins. Now uh, Adam and Eve are no longer pure. I used Islamic terminology to talk to him. They lost their purity. So God came and he sacrificed the very first animal. We read in Genesis chapter 3, God kills an animal and uses the skin of the animal to clothe them. Very similar to what he told uh, the Jews and the Israelites to do in offering animals to Abraham and all of them. So we can understand that that was probably the very first sacrifice ever done. God did it himself. And, and that blood was significant, but it was symbolic of someone else's blood, someone who was much more pure that could do this. So we went through uh, this whole thing about who could be that savior. Could it be Adam? He said, could it be? I said, well, Adam just sinned. So his, his blood is tainted with sin. He can't be the Savior. He goes, who is it? I said, I said, what about Abraham? Do you think it's Abraham? He goes, I don't know. I said, well, Abraham's parents also had sinned. So Abraham was born into this uh, world of sin. He cannot be the Savior. So we went all the way down the prophets. Every prophet that he knows who they are. I use those prophets. We went all the way down. We went all the way and I said, what about the prophet of Islam? Could he be the Savior of the world? He goes, he didn't want to answer that. He said he didn't know. I said, did, uh, did, did he have earthly parents? He said, yes. He said, were they tainted with sin? They had to be. And he said, well, what about Muhammad? He goes, well, then he's tainted with sin. Then who is it? I said, who, is, who you know in the world that was born that did not have an earthly father? Which Quran mentions Jesus being born without an earthly father. And we agree that was Jesus. And then be, he began to weep. He began to cry. He understood that Jesus is the one that came to die for our sins. Wow. So he's now uh, secretly worshiping Jesus. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah.
and and just by you taking through a journey of the Old Testament and helping to understand the the necessity of atonement, that's right. He came to the realization that Jesus yeah. is a sacrifice, and he tells me. He says, I've never forgotten what you told me. Wow. Yeah. Shaheen, lastly, you had an encounter with a Muslim lawyer. Yes. <coughs> Could you tell us about Iran. that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was uh, at college. I was, uh, we had a scholarship program and we were selling books door to door uh, Christian books, health books, magazines, and so we can make extra money towards our education. Uh, I, I received a phone call uh, on my cell phone. It was early in the morning. I was having my prayer day, morning devotion. And it was a friend of mine I hadn't seen for 10 months. And he told me, he said, uh, and by the way, when he called me, I did not know where he got my phone number from because I had, my phone number had changed and I had no call forwarding. He said, I want you to come to my home in two weeks and I want you to meet a woman from Iran. She's a Muslim. And she wants to become a Christian, but she has some questions. She can't cross this bridge. And you're an ex-Muslim. Can you come and talk to her? I said, sure, I'll be there. But I said, Edmund, where did you get my number from? I was very, very curious because he had no idea my number had changed. I hadn't seen him for 10 months. And uh, so where did you get my number from? He said, your number is in my cell phone. Uh, I said, okay, what number did you dial? He gave me the number and it was not my number. It was my old number that was disconnected and there was no call forwarding and I said Edmund that is not my number he said and we started to thank the Lord for 20 minutes we talked I gave him my new number that night I came back home <coughs> from work excuse me and I said uh, I called Edmund I said to myself let me see let me have him call that number one more time I called Edmund now he had my new number I said Edmund can you call that old number please and then let me know what happened so he calls that old number. He calls me back on my new number. He says, Shaheen, the recording says disconnected. He had called a disconnected number, and my new number rang. Now you tell me what are the chances. I talked to a telecommunication engineer, and he told me this is impossible. And he happened to be a man from Iran who was a Muslim himself. I just happened to meet him, and I told him the story. And, and uh, let me tell you why my number was disconnected. I was a student, poor student at the time. I was in the East Coast. I was doing my work. In 2001, there was a lot of roaming, and here I'm mean, this broke student. I couldn't pay my bill. It got disconnected. So it was a disconnected phone number that had no call for it. So I called the company, disconnected me. I said, listen, this is what happened. And they said, no, it can't happen. You're disconnected. I called my, the new company and said, it cannot happen. So it did happen. Jesus made that phone call go through because God wanted us to meet that Muslim woman. So you're telling me that this miraculous phone call happened because Edmund needed to tell you something about this Muslim woman about a Muslim and woman who needed some help she's a Christian today what happened with her well we met we talked um, she he's an attorney and she said she had to think about it so she called me a few days later and she confirmed that she wants to become a Christian and that she wants to accept Jesus and by the way she was a heavy smoker before I met her for three years she had not smoked because she simply asked Jesus, can you help me not smoke anymore? She had seen the power of Jesus, but she wanted to know how can Jesus be the Son of God? She didn't understand that Jesus could be God, but now she does. Wow, what was the change that happened with her? What, what did she realize that led her down that, that con Jesus, to that conclusion? That Jesus is God, that he can raise the dead. To a simple poetry that she read from a Muslim poet in Iran about a thousand years ago, that Jesus raised the dead. And she put the pieces together. The one who took my cigarette away, the one who raises the dead, he has to be the Son of God. I want to worship him. Wow. We've been talking with Shabazz and Shaheen about their faith journey. I'd like to turn to our live in-studio audience. Do we have any questions here? Right over there. Um, so there's a lot of like major religions in the world, but when it comes to Islam, why do you think Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world? You know, uh, is it okay if I tackle that? Many, many people have asked that question. The, the number one reason why Islam is growing so fast is not so much because Islam is necessarily attracting con new converts, and they are. They are attracting new converts, specifically from a, lo a lot of Western countries. But the numbers are not that large so to basically reflect on the religion is growing because of, of uh, conversion. 
The reason is because in Islam, you're Muslim at birth, and, and they have large families. A typical Muslim family could be anywhere between four to nine people. So this, this actually is giving Islam this huge kick, and they're growing really fast. So the minute the child is born, the father's job is to go to the child and in their ear uh, say the shahada, which is the prayer, and that child becomes a Muslim. So you're saying it's not necessarily Muslim evangelism that's creating these, these numbers. Rather, it, it's, a, it's a combination of, of obviously population growth in, in a lot Absolutely. of these countries. Uh, yeah. Like, for example, India, I know, has gone up the scale in population that's growth. Right. And, you know, there's lots of Muslims in India. Absolutely. So that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. We have any other questions? Right over there. Inherent in the concept of atonement is the love of God. Is there a difference, or what is the difference between the love of God and, say, the love of Allah? Shaheen? Mm. You know, uh, one thing you do not read in the book of Quran, it does talk about Allah is merciful, Allah is forgiving, but it never says Allah is love. When you read the Bible, the Bible says God is love. And it doesn't say, and uh, mind you, that the Bible doesn't say God has love. You have love for your family, I have love for my family. But the Bible says God is love. The Quran doesn't do that. And as you see in the Quran, there is no provision for the, re the salvation and the rescue of mankind. And it's somehow Allah leaves that for the individual and at the end says, well, let me see if they're worthy of, of heaven or not. But in Bible, you see a provision made. God takes a step because God is love and love cannot do anything but to bring about some kind of a resolution for his children and we are all his children. So if, I hope that answers your question because God is love is so much more different than when, Al, when Allah does not even clarify that about himself. Shaheen, and what you're pointing out is love is not just a characteristic of God. Uh, it's the very person of God. The very person of God. He embodies right. love. Right. He, he claims to that's be right. love itself and all love proceeds from him, and right? That, and that's how we sense his presence was love. Amen. And, and the presence of God just emanates that, that, because He is love. He can't do anything but to be love. You know, it's really fascinating when you're studying out the epistles that John wrote. Every time John speaks about love so much in his, you know, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, this is John the disciple. Mm -hmm. John uses the word God in the same sentence. And then every time he speaks about God, he uses the word love, love. in the same sentence. And right. to John, the longest living disciple, the youngest of all the disciples, who understood probably more about Christ than any of the other disciples, he wrote in his later epistles, he said so much about God that he, he could not speak about love without bringing yeah. up God, and he could not bring up God without bringing up love. And that's why he said God is love. That's right. He understood that. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's something I think very singular uh, to Christianity too, to what the Bible tells us about God's right. nature and who He is. That's right. Fantastic. Uh, we have any other questions? Right over there. Uh, in your Iranian and former Muslim community, do you witness or receive discrimination? Yes, w of course, uh, we, uh, we do witness, and there is witness, and there is from time to time persecution as well. So it, it kind of goes hand in hand. You know, a Christian can't witness without being persecuted. It just, it's just, it's, it's our lot. It's, it's, it's our part. Jesus said, if the master suffered, you will suffer also. And, and clearly, the world as we know it today, whether it's Islamic or not, they hate the gospel. They hate the message of Jesus' love. And, and we get a fair amount of that no matter where we go. You know, we have a, a friend, a mutual friend, and he was a pastor in Iran, and he was arrested, tortured for his faith. And uh, he said, as they were torturing me, I could hear my ribs crack, but I had no pain. And all I had in my heart was love for my persecutors. And that, so yes, there's persecution, but yes, but also there's grace that God gives to his people that are going through that. And this is an exhibit A of our friend. And if you see him today, he, even his wrist, you can see the marks and he, the, they would hang him from the ceiling and they would torture him. He still has those marks on his, but he, all he had for them was love. 
Now, you, you, you have to be very careful, um, especially you two, when, when, when dealing with uh, sharing the gospel. Uh, let's say in, in, in those areas, specific like in the Middle East, I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure there's places you just can't go anymore to. Yeah, that's correct. Results. Absolutely. Wow. Um, why don't we go to one more question? Right over there. Hi there. You had stated that there was a big shift, that there was 20% of the population of Iran was converting to Christianity. So do you have any advice for those people? The, the growth rate is about 20% annually. So right now there's uh, we're over a million, maybe a million and a half converts in Iran. In, uh, it's a con country of 80 million population. So uh, at that rate, uh, within the next 50 years, half the population will be Christian, which is, this is just like unheard of in, in a Muslim nation. Uh, the people, the, as they hold on to the hope of Jesus, this gives them strength to continue in their faith. Many of these people have home churches. They meet with a half a dozen people or a dozen people. And many times they have to change locations where they meet. They meet under severe circumstances, but every moment they spend together is as for them, this is their testimony, this is what they tell me, is as though they are, they are with, with God in heaven because Christ in person, though they may not see him, but he's blessing because he said when there's two or three gathered in my name, I'm there in their midst, but they feel him in their midst. They're having apostolic experiences and, and dreams and visions, angels coming to them. They are being nurtured and strengthened and kept in mo uh, as, as a church all across Iran. Different denominations, but they're all being blessed by God and the church is growing. I want to break down in tears because of the joy that I have of what's happening over there. What would you say to maybe um, someone who's Muslim who's struggling with the idea of faith and uh, m maybe even the idea of Jesus. What would you say to someone like that? I would encourage them to, to not shy away or feel that they may get their family to get upset or angry. When my family was angry at me, when they threatened to beat me up and, and, and Shaheen actually physically did. Shaheen tried. Yeah, he tried. <laughs> and the joy of seeing one by one my family members come to know Jesus. Mm. They didn't come to know Jesus because I twisted their arms. Right. They didn't become Christians because I threatened them. They became Christians because they saw Jesus in me. And I hope that they had seen Jesus in me. I'm sure yes, you can sir. testify oh. to that. And, and they saw Christ living in me and that is what converted them to change them I used to fast for them and, and and pray and fast and so my encouragement is don't give up hold on to the hope hold on to the promise Christ will show himself powerful in you and that's how God's gonna do it how about you Shaheen I would say the very fact that this person who are in maybe that are struggling is the very fact that God is working because they're giving the option of choosing and that means God is drawing them and I would say don't give up and if you have fears just talk to Jesus and I'm sure if he wants in a vision in a dream even God can send an angel to confirm and it does happen all over the Muslim world and God will confirm that they're on the right path just hold on beautiful Shaheen and Shabazz this has been a fantastic discussion 